Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remco Rinkema, and I am joined by the only person I could find that is uh, adequate enough to analyze the 2002 WSOP main event final table because Norman Chad and myself are now, just now, in 2020, reaching the level of play uh, in which we have maybe the upper hand at a final table as the one we are watching today. Uh, Norman, first and foremost, how are you doing? How are things uh, during this uh, strange time, as I want to say? Well, you use the word adequate, and I think adequate has served me well uh, during the poker boom. And during these strange times, it's not that strange for me, Remco. I'm usually just sitting in the house anyway, self-isolating. Right. Yeah, th that's probably for the better for everyone. Um, so uh, right now, I'm having a beer. Uh, cheers to you. Whatever. Cheers. Yep. There we go. Oh, straight vodka, I can tell. Uh, for everyone watching right now, this is Run It Back, in which we watch some old school poker action with the people involved, or people who have good opinions on this, or just Norman Chad. And Norman Chad is, is always one of my favorite people to have on this show. This is the 2002 main event, the year before poker went haywire with the Chris Moneymaker win. Also, a year before Norman Chad was first on the call. This was Lon McCarron and Gabe Kaplan on the call. So we're basically revoicing this final table. Um, not a lot of people that w you guys, the fans, might recognize, but obviously Robert Varconi is a name that everybody will remember because he was the one who took it down. Spoiler alert. Sorry, I'm not sorry. Um, we have this entire final table to break down. Tons of cash on the table, or at least near the table, and a, a you know strange-looking main event bracelet, looking back on it. Um, and gave with two microphones, because why not? Um, Norm, Norm, thinking back of 2002, this was, of course, the year before you joined, but were you already sort of, I don't know, close to getting a job like this? Were you already involved in production of poker in any sort of way? No, absolutely not. In fact, I would watch the World Series such as this. Uh, sometimes when it replayed on ESPN, I would not make a point of seeing it the first time. Uh, so this one, for instance, I had seen two or three times, maybe before uh, the 03 job I got, but I was not involved in poker in any way. Wow. So it's, it's probably safe to say that you haven't seen this in quite some time then? Correct. I haven't seen it in quite some time. In fact, I watched it when they involved me in, in, in consulting with them in 03 before I got the broadcasting job. They sent me three or four poker broadcasts to take notes on, and this was one of them, so I watched it back then. Wow. John Joe Kennedy, Binion's senior dealer, looks like 160 years old, and I, he probably still there right to this day. Like, that's... That's the type of people that you see in Las Vegas, which I love a little caricature of uh, Benny Binion there. Just so much history that we are watching right now. And I think that I can speak for almost everyone who is watching this show right now uh, that they've never seen this before. All right. Look at the chip counts here. I don't pause very much, but we have to sort of take into account what we are actually seeing here. Um, Norman, from this list of names, who do you remember or still have memories of? Because I think I have only three. Well, Russell Rosenblum, who continued to play afterwards, uh, and there's a misspell <laughs> Bethesda, Maryland, he's a lawyer from the D.C. area, and he made uh, another deep run a few years later. Ralph Perry is actually the, the victim of the greatest Tony G rant I've ever seen <laughs> in my life on YouTube. Uh, of course, Varconi won. Ming Lee uh, is a big cash game guy, uh, friends with Doral Brunson, so he stayed around afterwards. He doesn't play a lot of tournament poker. I knew nothing of Scott Gray, who's probably a cash game prior from Ireland. Julian Gardner. Uh, the original Robin Hood uh, was a very uh, – Manchester, England is misspelled there also. Production value is not always the same. Uh, Julian Gardner was a, a great young player. Uh, in fact, he becomes, I believe, the youngest player ever to win the amount of money he did at this time. Right. Uh, there you got Tony D, who you're not going to know much about. But Tony D, this year, believe it or not, he, he knocked out Greg Raymer just before the money bubble. No. So that was Raymer before Raymer. And then Harley Hall will look exactly like Harley Hall when you see him. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, John Shipley with the massive chip lead there uh, at the top. Uh, this so is, who do you remember? This is, this, well, the, the uh, Rosenblum, because he's still around, and I've, and I've seen him quite a few times. Then, of course, Ralph Perry, Varconi, Ming Lai, and Julian Gardner, I just know because he you know, goes deep in this event, but I don't have any, like, you know, memories of them, of him. But the funniest part for me watching this now is seeing the chip counts and seeing Robert Varconi was, was not even, you know, anywhere near the top and Chipley had a massive chip lead. So I'm kind of curious to see how Varconi makes his way to uh, winning this tournament. My, my number one Robert Varconi memory, by the way, is 2003, day one. He just like plays aces probably the worst possible way you can play pocket aces. And then he had... Um, Oh my God! He had MIT MIT guy on his uh, rail who was his coach. Yeah, the guy they had they had a playbook. Uh, <laughs> Greg, I remember. I mean, you know, nerdy MIT guy yeah. who was with him all the time. They had a playbook. They had a 
a thing of every situation, what you're supposed to do with, which doesn't really work, but it was an MIT guy and they thought they had the game solved. Kind of. Kind of. Um, do you, do you have memories of Robert Racconi even in the years that you were around? Did you interact with him at all? A lot. He's, you know, he's one of the sweetest guys, uh, I, I've ever met. And I give him a lot of credit, like him and Chris Moneymaker, the poker community is kind of rough. So they would be critical of both of them because their poker skills were not up to, let's say a Fader Holtz, uh, or Justin Bonomo. So they used to clobber these guys. Marconi is just a, you know, regular guy from New York who worked in the finance industry. Uh, he knows he's not a great player. He just comes back to the main event every year. His wife, Olga, also uh, was taught how to play. She comes to. It's a delightful couple. And actually, she was pregnant when he won. The, uh, we had a spoiler alert, so we know he wins. When he won this event, she was pregnant with their first child, which he then named Victoria because he was the uh, the victor in the uh, main event. Wow. That, that's that's actually a really great story. I love that. Uh, but as you said, Tony D is still around then. Tony, oh, these these whole card graphics are terrific. I think we got, let, let's just tune into this hand here. We got pocket nines and aces. With a pair of aces in the first hand of the final day of the World Series of Poker. And how is he going to play this? Well, he's not going to raise all his chips. No, he'll call for sure. We know that. Oh, well, you know he's going to call. Uh, but we don't know if he's going to, he's probably going to raise, he's counting out, I think, about 100, 150,000. And make sure Robert does not go out. He's raised, He's 100 raised 150000 Hold on. So the first hand we see is Robert Rocconi with nines against Julian Gardner's aces. Robert says he's all in. Robert is hoping his nines hold up. <laughs> now the world knows what he's got. Wow. Serious trouble. Serious trouble, yeah. And you saw that little smirk. I, I think he thought he might have had an edge with those two nines, but now he needs a third nine probably to take this hand. Well, if, um, if Julian didn't have an overpair, tens to aces, then Robert would be in pretty good shape, but he's in terrible shape now. He's actually about a four and a half to one underdog. Deuce, ten, six. He could win with a nine or a seven and an eight. Would make him a straight. There's another deuce, and now he's dead to that nine. The only way Robert could win is with a nine. And England has just scored a goal in the finals of the World Cup. So that's Julian Gardner doubling up through Varconi right away, which means that Varconi is one of the short stacks now after this hand. Um, wow. Yeah, as you saw, he wasn't uh, in great shape to begin this final table, and then he ran into this immediately, and it made him a very short stack. And the very likable Julian Gardner with the left-handed fist pump, which I love. <laughs> that is that is kind of rare, actually, the left-handed fist pump. M m he must also throw with, with his left hand then, in that case, if that's his dominant cheering hand. I, believe so. I gotta believe he's left handed. I, I don't know. I never spoke to him. I never saw him uh, when well, I came after this. Do you have a what, what's your go to cheer? Is it the two fisted? Uh, the two fisted. I, I really don't have a, a go to cheer. Uh, you know, when I play Racco, uh, they got Manchester spelled right there. When I play Racco, which is a great card game, I do a Racco dance when I win, but that's only in private because uh, I don't want the public to really see that. Is, is that more explicit than the Ukaluka or? Much more explicit. One of the fun things about Racco. Uh, Remco, which is a great game for families. A great, it's a great gambling game for adults. Is that when you're supposed to yell out Racco when you win, and then I would do the Racco, you, you Racco celebration, which would make more and more, and more ornate and more and more complicated just to get my stepkids really mad when they were little. <laughs> Everyone has a go-to uh, home home game in the sense of you know the the local card game that is being spread on kitchen tables all across the world. Um, for the people in the chat, if you enjoy the, this broadcast or if you're wondering what the hell are you watching, yeah, that's a great question because I really know what we're doing either. What we are doing, however is watching the O2 main event. Uh, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, do all that good stuff, and let us know how you feel. Varconi taking a huge hit there, down to 230K. Uh, Gardner now up to 750. And uh, yeah, Varconi really among the shortest stacks here at this final table. So I'm curious to see how lucky he gets in order to win this, or perhaps he just starts running over the table in some kind of capacity. So Gardner... Well, he does play hands. Uh, this this, this uh, World Series is infamous for the fact that Phil Helmy... Uh, who did a little commentary on it, uh, was very upset with Barconi's style of play. Barconi's favorite hand was Queen-10, which he continued to win with. And uh, Helmy's made a big deal about uh, if Barconi wins this thing, I'm going to shave I'm gonna shave my head. I remember that. I remember that being a big, a big thing. And I think that that footage has to be here in here at the end. I, I can't wait to actually see that. As far as the O2 main event... Um, sparking interest for poker there was obviously growth year over year oh two to oh three there was there were more players um was this a big deal when it was on tv do you remember this being aired at like a good time like on not on espn no you know i don't remember being aired at a good time as i said i only watched it on rerun uh but there was indeed uh a, a varconi effect before a moneymaker effect you know robert was unlucky 
that he won a year earlier than he, you know, would have been a big deal because that was spread out over ESPN all over the place when Chris won. But they they increased the field from 631 this year to 839 in the moneymaker year, which is a 33% increase, which was the hugest increase in World Series history and the, the hugest number of people. So there was a, a, a Barconi effect that we sometimes forget about. Right. It's actually good that you reference that because I think many people will just think that you know, all of a sudden, moneymaker shows up and everything goes haywire. But there was there was more of a lead up to it. Um, at, at what by the way, Remco, yeah. before the Varconi effect, there was a rounders effect that wasn't as nearly as big as the Varconi effect. A lot of people got into hold them because of rounders, which wasn't a box office smash. But rounders came out in I think ninety eight or ninety nine, and a lot more people got into the game, and the, the numbers went up, and then it went up again. Here we got another brawl in. <laughs> oh, I think they're he folded, earlier. He folded, I yeah. Ralph, Ralph Perry in the sunglasses. Ralph, Ralph Perry looks like what a Ralph Perry should look like, and uh, I agree. <laughs> and and the fact that he's he's wearing the sun like he doesn't need the sunglasses. He still he looks cool already with the with the, the the suit on. But the sunglasses were also chosen perfectly. You know, sometimes people pick the wrong sunglasses. Ralph Perry picked the right sunglasses. He doesn't. You know, I did not like the film Uncut Gems, the Adam Sandler. Oh, uh, I hated it. You know, I hated it, but Ralph Perry looks like one of the guys who should have been in Uncut Gems. Yeah, exactly. And Ju Julian Gardner would have been the message boy who runs <laughs> runs errands for the guy who is uh, running the sports book. Um, but yeah, looking back at the numbers of the main event, uh, it was Stu Unger who won it in '97. I believe that's when Rounders was filmed, and it came out in '98. And correct me if I'm wrong; people are probably going to correct me on that. But every year since, there was a pretty steep increase. Uh, oh, and here's Helmy. Let's listen in what he has to say. Yep. Right, and I think they realize that the difference between ninth and first place is so enormous, between two million and eighty-five thousand, that they don't want to come in ninth. They realize that they're going to have to do something. They're going to have to make a move real early in the tournament, uh, otherwise they're just going to lose their chip. So eighty-five, eighty-five k is that what he said for ninth place, and then two million for first? Uh, I believe so. That's just that's just a, the, a terrific payout. Um, the question I was trying to talk towards was: At what point did you become aware? of the WSB main event? Like, when did it become, you know, more widespread as, as far as awareness goes? Because years of the main event were already filmed dating back to 1973. That was the first time it was ever filmed. Then there was a large gap to 78, and then there were right. more and more uh, years being filmed. Um, and the, the most famous ones are obviously... Um, uh, 87, 88, and 89, uh, the two Johnny Chans and the, the Helmuth year. So do you have a memory of, like, when this became something on your radar? It wasn't very much on my radar. You know, I didn't uh, start playing poker in a card room until 1999 after I moved to Los Angeles. So I didn't really watch the World Series of Poker uh, that much. And again, it, when it came on ESPN, it wasn't like it was re-aired a million times like it, it, it was in the Moneymaker era. So I didn't really come on to my radar, even though I ended up watching some of these. And then I watched, I really enjoyed the ones which uh, Vince Van Padden's father, the late Dick Van Padden, Hosted, it seemed like every year he'd roll up in a car and walk out of the car in front of Binion's and go, welcome to Las Vegas and welcome to this. And he's a great, you know, he's a wonderful poker player and a wonderful personality. Those are the ones I remember, but they really didn't come under the radar to me again until the late 1990s. Right. And then, of course, year over year, massive growth. Oh, by the way, here goes Varconi, King Queen, sees a flop against 7-8 and... Uh... Let's see the flop, actually. John Shipley is a huge underdog in this hand. He actually has nothing right now. He would have to get seven and an eight on the next card. I'm curious. I we, we missed the pre-flop action, but it's it's a small blind against big blind. Marconi flops a pair, and um, Shipley has four outs here on the on the turn to make a straight. He would win if a six comes out. That would make him a straight, and that would be a terrible beat for Robert Marconi. It's an eight. Oh, <laughs> close. Well, Robert on the cusp of leaving this tournament, but he will live to fight. Wow, so Varconi could have been the first player out here from the final table. He gets the double up, and uh, you know we're, we're witnessing history of the Varconi effect. And it's, it's funny to see poker showdowns. And I, I've been watching so much WSOP the last few months during quarantine, and we've been getting all this stuff ready for Poker Go. And I'm super excited that we now have everything on PokerGo. So if you are a real poker fan and you want to watch all this stuff in high quality, it is all available on PokerGo 2003 all the way up to the current year, which is absolute and crazy amount of poker. Uh, but one of the funniest things that always stands out when you watch these old broadcasts is that the turn of one card, as obvious as it sounds, changes everything in so many different uh, spots. You know, And you know, we all remember the big bluffs that work, but just think about all the showdowns that 
have to go your way to even have a chance in the main event. And, you know, th th this Varconi situation is a great example of that because he's like one of the short stacks with nine left. And, uh, you know, he goes on to win it. Yeah, and actually, you know, uh, this is Gabe before, obviously, high stakes poker. And I get a lot of criticism, as I should, for not being a poker strategy guy. But if you listen to Gabe during this broadcast, we just heard him. He needs a six down the river for the straight. And, oh, it's an eight. Close. If I ever said he needs a six on the river on the straight, and, oh, it's an eight. It's close. I would be bombarded for years on end. So it's, it's a simpler level of analysis at that time. Yeah. Uh, but do you think that with your 2020 level of uh, hold and play, uh, you'd be a factor in the O2 main event? No, I would never be a factor. As I've said many, many times, Reco, in a sit and go with nine Franciscan monks, I am an underdog. Wow. That's... Yeah, I just don't play well. I mean, you, you, do, you, do you even play Hold'em ever, or is, is it just you stick to the, to the limit I, games? I only play it in charity events, and that's not even playing Hold'em because it's half the people there don't even play know how to play. So I only play them in charity events, and then it, you know, I'll play Limit Hold'em as part of a, a mix, like a horse mix, but I never, I never play No Limit Hold'em ever. Right. It's funny how they have Helmuth and, and Gabe here on the call, and Lon is, is not on screen. So, Well, there's a reason for that. So how how did that work? What would take us behind the curtain? It's pretty and it's a pretty simple production thing. Lon was not there. Lon was not hired to do this until afterwards. So when they went to do it in post production, they needed a play by play person, and Lon somehow got hired. So he is not on site here. He is not part of. Gabe was on site, obviously. Uh, he does the, the the bust out interviews, and he's doing this stuff with Helmuth. But Lon did not come aboard until afterwards when they put together the two one hour shows. Oh, that's really funny. There was actually, I was actually surprised there was two hours of footage that they made for this because a lot of final tables, even in the later years, were just cut down to one hour. Um, by the way, look at the chip grounds here again. Marconi still one of the short stacks. Look at Tony D and Harley Hall just sitting on their hands. Oh, by the way, oh my God, did you see that? The bottom two stacks were reversed. There's another production. <laughs> see, in post-production, that should not happen because this isn't live. But again, sometimes you're in a rush and sometimes you're going to catch a flight and mistakes are made. That's, that's amazing. Um, do, do you recall any mass, major mistakes, either calling the action or you know, just getting, getting something really wrong and then seeing it, only noticing it on TV? I, in this broadcast, I don't recall on the voicing if there was a major mistake. I doubt there was. I did recall, as I've already, you already noted, some typos on cities and what you just saw. So that happened. Obviously, that's we've seen three times already. We haven't seen that many graphics. No, but also, I mean, in your career, as like voicing. Oh, my God, of course. It's, you know, that is that's as that's professional malfeasance. It's like a <laughs> felony. So because we're taping afterwards. So we're taping. So, you know, we've got time to do it and other people are listening to me talk. And, yeah, we have made mistakes uh, that we did not catch and correct. And we just move on with our lives because it's just, you know, it's just poker. Yeah. No, the, the, it is funny sometimes when you watch these old, old broadcasts and, you know, they get the number of outs wrong or whatever. But then I, I just I was I was hoping for a juicy story there. Of you, oh, you, the only you, best one I can give you is when we did the U.S. Poker Championship, which used to be at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City and uh, ESPN did. The second year we did that, the winner of the uh, event, and we did like four broadcasts, four hours of that. Uh, we we, mis we mispronounced his last name the entire the entire four hours. Oh my god! It's John D'Agostino. We said John D'Agostino, uh, and we've had to apologize to him. Uh, I don't think he really looks me in the eye when I apologize to him. But yeah, we had his name wrong for the entire four hours. That's how good we are. <laughs> That's incredible. By the way, was that a, was that a puppy that I saw there, Norm? Yeah, I should have brought her up on the couch since she's brand new and she's a little active. But this is the the new rescue dog, uh, rescue pup I got, courtesy of Jamie Kerstetter oh. out of Las Vegas. Uh, her name is Blue, and I just got her two days ago. Oh, that's incredible. What's up, Blue? Eight that weeks old. Pit mix, and she's very, very active. Yeah, I mean, that's good for you. Get you out of the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it'll be great. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, definitely a morale boost. Yeah, no, I can, I can only imagine. Uh, Ming Lai all in here. And up yeah, against Ralph Perry. Yeah, he is. He knows that he's a slight favorite. And Robert's going to need, uh, I mean, Ralph's going to need a ace or a king on the flop. Oh, got there's it. a king. There's he's a king. Got a king. He's now in the lead, and Min is dead to uh, eight. He needs an eight. It's the only way he can win. All of Min's chips are in the pot. Right. He's going to be out if an eight doesn't come on this card. He's the eight. Min Lee. A seven. Min and Lee is it. our first casualty. He is place. indeed. From Las Vegas via Vietnam. He made it a great week for himself, but he is the first player to leave the final table. Min Lee will take home $85,000.
All right, shake hands with everybody. But All right, we lost our first player at the final table. <laughs> and Ming, Ming Lee also didn't age for the next 15 years after this uh, final table because I believe I saw him last year and he looked exactly the same. Yeah, either good diet or good skincare products. But yes, uh, Ming always looks the same. I mean, that's the thing about being inside in a casino all day long. You don't get a lot of exposure to the sun, so your skin stays very nice. <laughs> We're watching the O2 main event final table. Oh, well, this is actually kind of cool. As, as, as it was a live event, they're showing hand 33, how long they've been playing and all that stuff. Um, do you recall? Yeah, I, give, I give them credit for when we did it in post-production. We didn't want to lose the plausibly live uh, conceit. So we would never have done that. They, in this two-hour thing, just decided to go right ahead. Because it sounds, when you listen to Lon and Gabe, it sounds like they're there and it sounds like they're live. But they do show you, as you just saw, this is hand 33 and an hour and 20 minutes of real time has elapsed. Right. And yeah, that's, that's really cool. Really well done. We've got another big hand here. I think I saw just ace-queen flash on the screen and, and pocket queens. So we might get another all-in short on here. Tony D, very short in the one seat over here. Still thinking about it. We might have three players in this hand. Look, Look Carly's won four hands. <laughs> Four, four of 31. <laughs> By the way, it is cool. It's, it's funny to see Ultimate Bet and Party Poker um, having a presence already at the World Series of Poker back then. Um, that must have been massive for those brands. Harley gives it up. Sure. Big showdown once again. Tony D is in dire need of an ace. Tony D probably has two big blinds at this point. Like, he's got almost no chips. Tony D needs an ace. To stay in this tournament. Here comes the flop. No ace. No the ace. King nine deuce. Nine deuce. Two, two spades. spades. Two spades. Right. Well, spades. Scott's got a spade. Two queens still in the lead for Scott. Ace Rick. of oh. spades. <laughs> That's very Scott interesting because, that. like you said, Scott the has the queen of spades, spades and spades if a spade, spade comes up, Scott will win and knock Tony D out of the tournament. So basically. Oh, by the way, mind the jacket as well that Scott is wearing. Ace queen or a spade, otherwise uh, Tony's going to double up. That's a three. Tony D. Doubles up. Comes through. Tony D when he Tony needed it most. He had the hand and, and the turn, turn section in full force. John Benetti. I was going to say, was that John Benetti? Yes, it was. What, wasn't he, he? On one of the telecasts I had to watch uh, for ESPN, he was uh, heads up with Daniel Negrano in like the Jack Binion Open uh, down in Mississippi. And they were both miked. It was very, very entertaining. And it was a precursor to what we needed to do in miking uh, the players. Right. So as far as the inner workings of a TV production such as the main event. By the way, Varconi chipping up nicely here as we see Harley Hall still at the bottom of the counts with uh, Tony D, um, only sitting on a few big blinds, you know, given that we're hand 69, three hours in, they're still eight-handed, which goes to show how tight play was back in those days. Um, as far as taking us behind the scenes and what goes into the production of this, um, miking up, you know, various different cameras, the whole sort of setup for a final table like this. Um, explain to us a little bit of what goes into the post-production of it and when you guys are, are voicing this behind the scenes. Well, when the, the post-production essentially is, the, it's, it's, it's a, essentially a highlight version of what happens. So it's edited down. And the, you know, the editors and the uh, producers have to go through all the footage and they're taking notes while it's, it's happening to pick out what hands they think they're going to use. But they have to figure out what hands they're going to use. There's, there's got to be like a story arc. They're, they have to do hands that lead into commercials, hands that end episodes. So it's a big production thing in terms of planning what the final telecast is going to look like. For me and Lon, that's the simplest thing to do is we just come in and they we look at one hour edited broadcast and we start voicing them. The production before that is the big deal. We just come in and voice them uh after they've got down to the, you know, essentially a 47 minute broadcast for each hour. Right. So as far as, you know, uh, some of the, the jokes you have and some of the scripts you guys have, how much of that is just you and how much of that is directed by what production wants? Uh, actually, just from, from the beginning, uh, they didn't even know what I was going to do. Uh, it's almost all me. I mean, I didn't even script anything the first few years because I wanted to have a live feel to it and everything. And as the years went by, Remco, it, it, there's several reasons why I decided that it made sense to script more of it beforehand it makes a lot of sense so yeah it's all, almost all me sometimes uh our, our lead producer right now uh, dan Gotti, uh will will help me out with some stuff that he sends me that he thinks is, it might be funny and i'll use some of his stuff uh so but you know but 90 percent of what i say is just coming out of my mouth for the first time uh nobody else knows what it's going to be i mean that actually surprises me i thought you had like a list of you know things you wanted to refer to and then you know you sort of go for it but the fact that it's on the spot makes it even better uh, yeah, it's just, it goes back and forth, but uh, I love doing it on the spot at the beginning. 
uh, it, was, it was like a challenge. But then when I saw how many times it was re-airing, and then just for more bang for the buck for the viewer to make it a higher quality, I realized I had to give more preparation to it. So not just knowing about the players and stuff, but I had to prepare for the right moments and and know when the the table talk was going to come because that's another part of the voicing that's very difficult. You know, I have to stop and start when the people are talking at the table. So I did a lot more preparation on that, and that also entailed then writing things to a certain amount of time to get out of in time so that the players could talk. Right. That's, that, that's actually very interesting to, to learn how that process works. Um, right here we have Ralph Perry wearing uh, two rings, one of his one on his pinky, one on his uh, actual sort of maybe wedding ring, but it had a lot of diamonds. But Harley Hall all in here with ace-queen suited after 69 hands and then looked up by Ralph Perry who has the pocket tens. He's an ace or a jack. You got it, you got uh, it, Jack. No. Harley doubles up. Wow, the American comes through, the American amateur comes through. And if he misses Harley, she's happy. And oh, Ralph was Greg Randall. Did you see that, Greg? Gre I did not notice that till just now when I watched it. Obviously, I wouldn't have known him. Hold on. We got to <laughs> freeze frame that. We got to freeze frame that. That's really, really interesting. The American amateur comes through. And if he misses Harley. Look at Greg. Wow, you hung around. That's incredible. As I mentioned earlier, he got knocked out before the money bubble uh, by Tony D. And he's there for the final table. That's awesome. I mean, Greg told me on Run It Back on this very show, 4 to 04 main event, that this was his first main event in 02. And the fact that he stayed around for the final table, channel, 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 channeling that energy for, for two years down the line is obviously awesome. Oh, Robert Vercone with the handshake there for the guy who doubled up. Something we also don't see anymore. Right. Handshakes. You don't see that at all anymore. Handshakes. By the way, I'm glad you noted the pinky ring. And I like the toothpick out of Harley. He was oh. also an early, early, you know, just one of the, 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 I think one of the forecursors or the precursors of the toothpick becoming popular. But the pinky ring is not seen often enough. No. It, it, I always thought pinky ring was like some mafia stuff. Same here. I, I don't, you hardly see it anymore. I think it's a generational thing. I think it's gone out of style. And maybe the mobsters still do wear the pinky ring. I'm gonna. I'm as we're watching it. I'm gonna look up Harley Hall on Hendon Mob. See what his last cash was. Okay. That's a good question. 2007. His style evolved. He um, he this wore uh, he wore the Bose headphones with an Adidas sweater and uh, I think it was a Hakkasan nightclub hat on the last time he played. Um, seeing a photo of him. Oh really? Wow, he did evolve then. Yeah, he he turned into an actual the look of a poker player. Um, his first cash at the WSC was in 2001 in a $3,000 no limit event. Uh, and then his third cash was the, this main event where he uh, went quite deep. Let's see what his first, okay. So the first ever cash Harley Hall made in the main event was a bracelet event where Eric Seidel beat Johnny Chan heads up. How about that? That's pretty good history. Reversing reversing what, what uh, Chan we did to, to Seidel. Yeah. Russell's got a 10 deuce of dime, is a little bit better hand. Is it? That's uh, his wife. 10 to a flop deuce all spades. Three spades, but with a ten or a deuce. So Russell has uh, has flopped two pair here. <laughs> he looks like he's caught in the headlights. Sixty. Happy he to see the two uh, pair. Sixty thousand. And John Shipley. And nothing for Shipley here. Um, a lot more suits back in those days uh, at the final table. Was that was that a common sight in in the poker room in general, or do, or these people dressing up for the final table? Uh, again, I was not into a poker room until 1999, so I can't answer that. They did. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a Las Vegas sort of a Las Vegas tradition uh, that, for instance, when you went to go shows, if you, you, you would go to a Cirque du Soleil back then, which wasn't around then, you actually would dress up. And people at this type of thing were going to get a little dressed up, at least when they played. So it was not that unusual. And there is, uh, is that Matt? I could have sworn that was Matt uh, Matris. Well, I also saw Greg Raymer cheer really hard for Russell Rosenblum. So maybe he had a piece. Uh, that's possible, too. <laughs> uh, By the way, John Shipley check raised with the Jack Four. Um, having is it is that Matt Matros in the middle there it, clapping? Who yeah, is that? it has to be. It has to be Matt. That, oh, who else could it be? Yeah, and Greg Raymond right behind him, and they're they're cheering hard for him. So I hope they have a piece. Yeah, that's that's definitely Matt Matros. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. This is like a time machine. It's <laughs> it's like you know you're, we're we're digging through archives and we've dusted off some footage and now we're trying to piece to, piece together what actually happened back in those days, which is pretty cool. Oh, this music too. TV, TV back in the day was definitely a very, a very different beast. Um, 
How, how long did it, did it take you guys to voice, you know, one hour of a show? Was that, you know, over and over takes and that sort of, that sort of thing? And when we first started, I had this conversation with Lon a lot. The first couple of years we did it. Uh, we would do one show a day. We would get into there at 930 in the morning. We would often walk out of there at seven or eight o'clock at night. All we're doing was taping 47 minutes and we were exhausted. So we, I couldn't believe it could take this long. I couldn't believe how exhausted we were. And that's what we did the first few years. We got quicker as it went on because we didn't have to do the retakes and we didn't have to do stops. And sometimes in the early years, we'd have to redo entire segments. We'd finish the segment and the producer would tell us, you didn't frame the big moments well enough. You didn't call that hand right. Let's go back and do the whole segment over again. They were right. But it was a long, long day back then. And we got it down when we did the first production company, which was 441 Productions, where we still did one a day, but we'd get out of there by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now we do two shows a day where we start at 10 in the morning and we're done by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but it was an incredibly brutal, grueling day, if you could believe that, just sitting in front of a TV monitor uh, back in the early days. Yeah, how do you think I feel right now? Long, long day. Just this, this, this is only an hour and a half of my day, and it's, it's grueling. Uh, Robert Varconi there with the King Queen. We see Harley Hall picking up a uh, pocket pair of sixes, so it seemed. Let's see if we got any more action behind him. Tony D is out. The kid, as they call him, in England is out. And it's between Robert, two Americans. Two Americans. Well, first uh, American face off we've seen in quite a while. All right, let's see what happens here. Let's see if Varconi. Tries to get cute here with the King Queen. Nine seven four didn't help Robert Varconi. He still got King High. Harley still has his pair of sixes. Robert needs to match. Robert checks. Harley checks. Nobody that confident. A five comes out and that gives Harley an open and straight draw. He's got four, five, six, seven. Robert checks. <laughs> so passive. Harley oh, checks again. Both of them check twice. Last card is a deuce. There's a flush out there, but that doesn't help. And now, and now he bets. Nope. It's, it's like, Robert, you make a little bet here. Trying to buy the pot with King High. Bet 60000 With a glare at Harley as well. What he's trying to do here is get I mean, Harley this is a very easy call for Harley. I think that's what he's trying to do. <laughs> See, Harley might have an ace with a three or something. And, uh, well, that doesn't work for Varconi. There you go. <laughs> King Queen. The, the, the funny thing is, is I watched the 1995 main event a couple weeks ago. And for the people who tuned in for that show, I was doing it solo. And we we're just watching the 1995 main event final table. And that, of course, was the Dan Harrington win back in, in 95. The interesting part about that was that Harrington was completely running over the table and no one had a chance. And to think back of how big the skill gap was back in those days between the actual people who had figured it out up until, you know, that year versus the, the amateurs like a Varconi or like a Harley Hall or people um, right. along those lines. That is just, for us right now, and I'm talking to you guys back home, incomprehensible. Indeed, and then you can also then see some of the Poker Brats uh, aggravation with the level of play that was winning at this point. This would have been 13 years after his main event title, and he was definitely uh, entrenched as one of the better No Limit Hold'em tournament players. And to watch the way this was played out, before the final table, it just drove him crazy. Yeah, and, and I feel as though Helmuth must have been so far ahead of the curve for so long that for him, and I love you, Phil, it is so hard to understand now that he is no longer that far ahead of the curve. He's like way behind. But of course, his style still works against the amateurs. And I mean, that's what most pros say, that he, he's really good at getting the money from the amateurs and against the really good players. He has no chance. Phil will argue with you from, you know, from till the cows come home about that, that he's not falling behind. I think he studied GTO for a, a good part of an afternoon. So whatever his style does in the tournament, the World Series atmosphere, it works. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true. Varconi here raising the button with the jacks. Shipley three betting. Shipley, by the way, very aggressive. Bluff failed there against Russell uh, Rosenblum just earlier. And he's probably trying to get some kind of feel for how loose uh, Robert Varconi is at this point. He's looking straight at the chips, but he's. He, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that he's thinking about possibly calling an ace jack. It's a kind of very marginal hand. To throw in another eight hundred thousand dollars. So I think I, I think Shipley three bet and Marconi went all in. Seen him that much, wondering really what yeah what he's got. Correct. 
Yes, I think if anybody else this table had raised seven hundred fifty, eight hundred thousand dollars. I don't think John Shipley. John's gone, right? Yeah, if Julian Gardner put in that kind of money. Uh, no, Ralph Perry put in that kind of money. Uh, John Shipley wasn't exactly thinking about it, but Robert okay. has done kind of that's, unorthodox things. He, he bet clean ten. Got a watch. I mean, it even <laughs> even the table talk and the bet sizing and stuff. It, it feels like a twenty dollar home game. I mean, if we're talking, if we're talking like he didn't get to ra point ranges, point. applying that to this, yeah. Barconi's range like probably doesn't even include jacks. It's like queens are better, given how tight he was. So here we come. <laughs> I don't know what he's gonna do, but it's it's really. Uh, it's really a very marginal hand. I love the close-up of Ralph Perry just because he looks cool. He's not even in the hand. Right. There we go. Wow. The hand that Tony D had early with Scott Gray, where uh, Scott Gray had queens and Tony D had ace queen. I got to tell uh, him. Robert Bocconi saying, what do I have? What do I got? Jacks, Robert. There they are. There they are. And wow. I mean, John Shipley, respect for you, but... You're giving it away. Massive chip lead and just risking it all with Ace Jack, or at least risking most of it here against Varconi. Yeah, a large part of his downfall. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, Shipley was from was one of the guys that I used to watch on on like a late night poker when I was still in the Netherlands. That was like one of the shows that he was on. Um, but his, his aggression is definitely great, but calling it off there um, doesn't seem as great. Wins $2 million pot with the dollar sign. There's his coach, his coach. There he is. After the first hand, is now the new chip leader in the World Series of Poker. It's unbelievable. I, I, I can't tell you, and I don't think anyone can tell you what was going on. Uh, maybe we'll ask John Shipley why this he is, thought uh, for Rob, some reason. Wife on the right. Oh, yeah, there she is. Olga. Yeah, and, and they were heavily featured on the broadcast in the years that followed, which, you know, of course, made a yeah. lot of sense. Um, yeah, he's. Yeah, what, John, what are you doing, John? That was, that was ridiculous. That's what Gabe was just talking about. So, yeah. yeah, that was the big part of his downfall. And that fueled Barconi. I mean, that made Barconi the chip leader. That was just a huge boost for him at that point. Yeah, two million chips. Um, and that's what Chipley had to start the final table. And Barconi was down at 200K, you know, not too long ago. Never before seen here at the World well, Series see. of Poker. A $25,000 chip. They'll be using those because when there's six million on the table, even stacks of 10,000 become unmanageable. So we got a new chip introduced, which is kind of funny to think about because now what, what are we dealing with? A million dollar, million, million tournament chips? Those big red ones, the oversized ones? Uh, I'm not sure. All right, here we have it. Marconi leading, 2.3 million, then Russell, and then um, Ralph and Julian quite close together, and then four short stacks. John Shipley, man, he could have folded his way to three-handed with that massive stack that he had. So I remember Varconi at some point, I think you said he was at 200,000. He had like 3% of the chips on the table Yeah. Uh, when he was that low. And to be the chip leader now, it's just a remarkable uh, run for him. Also, he has no idea how to stack his chips because they're all in a giant row over there. <laughs> I play with a guy at, at Hollywood Park in Los Angeles who's an older guy who does that all the time. He actually asks people to square the table, which is to get everybody in their right spot, because he wants to take up more room with his garden apartments to go all the way across. <laughs> That are way further than his body. We go, Pat, you're crazy. You're the one taking up two spots with that stupid chip thing. Well, Robert Bacconi <laughs> was doing the same thing. I mean, half the fun of half the fun of playing live with a lot of chips is like re-racking and, and coming up with new ways to stack your chips. Uh, I'm sure it's not something you ever have to worry about, Norm, but still. Uh, I, you know, you, you telegraph that one. I could see that one coming from a mile away. Yeah. Uh, but it was a good shot. Yeah. But at least in limit games, you can buy in for a lot. So you can just, you know. At least feel as though you're having a big stack. All right, aces for Varconi. Let's see what he does. Gonna raise. Russell calls immediately. Russell calls. No, he wants to make a stand. Russell will get very unlucky if a queen comes on this flop because he'll he'll go all in if a queen comes. Two jacks. Two jacks, jacks and a jack nine. nine. A check. Robert check. Russell bets two hundred thousand. That's two hundred thousand. And all in. <laughs> yes, Robert does not wait. He goes all in. And that is, is all in. the strength you carry with those Russell chips. Ball. 
Uh, he says courtesy and he Jeff shows uh, he shows <laughs> <other races. laughs> the look on Russell's face was like come on dude <laughs> well that's even better <laughs> absolutely so Robert Marconi starting to show that he maybe is worthy of at least two million of that six million dollar stack Thanks. of money Bill Helmuth I love how they verbalize their bets much more than we do today, especially the check. Nobody says check anymore. It's one of 53 different motions. Right. Yeah, we have the finger tap, and we have the full hand tap, and we have the elbow tap. And the, my, one of my favorite ones is this one. Oh, yeah. The one there, yeah, that's right. When it's, their hand happens to be there already. So I'll give them, you know, they're lazy, but at least the hand's there. They don't go all the way up there to do that. It's just there right there, and they go like that. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's see what he has to say. Oh, through law school. And uh, knock on wood, I finished first in my class while uh, coming out here to play the World Series between exams in two consecutive years. So I consider myself quite lucky, and I hope that I can continue to be lucky today. Um, Tony D is a oh, wow. very, uh, very popular high limit player. He's well known. He's probably has more poker experience than anyone else at this table, uh, playing high limit and the toughest games against the toughest competition. That's kind of funny, actually. Chris Ferguson in a suit. Um, man, the full tilt era feels like so long ago right now when all those guys were, you know, patched up and everybody was wearing the full tilt, um, you know, logos and stuff. W did you ever catch wind of how much those guys were getting paid to wear just a hat or to like slap on a logo and stuff like that? It, it varied, but, uh, if you were like, if you were just an amateur who's going to the feature table, uh, it often would be, it would be minimum thousand dollars. Sometimes it'd be $5,000. Uh, yeah. That, so the poker stars in full tilt. Marketing people would hang around and they'd see who was going onto the table and the tables were being shifted and they would just walk up to you and say, if you wear this, this, this patch or this baseball cap while you're on that table, we'll give you X amount of dollars. It was generally, again, in the uh, you know, low four figures. Right. And then, of course, when you made the final table, you would get the big, the big payouts for, for that TV time. All right. Another oh, yeah. big showdown. Tony D all in against uh, Rosa Varconi, I believe, Ace King. Right there, he knows, he knows the odds. Yeah, he knows he's in trouble. Actually, the odds are probably a little less than two to one. Flop. Here's a flop seven four deuce, two hearts. No jacks, no queen. Any players are hard here is Robert. I would never let me call a flop. <laughs> eight of hearts. Eight of hearts. That, that, that makes things a little worse for Tony because Robert has the uh, king of king of hearts. So Tony needs a queen or a jack. That's not a heart. Twenty way can stay in the tournament. Jack and stay. Could be it for Tony D, and it is. That's it. Uh, well, he is known as an aggressive player. He was just stifled the whole day. He never really had a chance to play his game. And graciously Tony D eliminated. You were saying, Lon, let, never let you call the flop. Is that one of those things between an announcers, commentators, that you have sort of your spots and, and he has his spots? Well, oh, sure. He's. I mean, he's the play-by-play -play guy, and I'm the whatever commentator, analyst, whatever you want to call it. So he is going to call the flops, as you see here. And actually, when I watched the World Poker Tour uh, over the years, Mike Sexton and oh look, they're handing oh, this cat. What the so hell? <laughs> that, yeah, on your way you go. Here, on your way you go. Here's ninety-five thousand or oh, hundred k by the way. So much more paperwork today, and they always <laughs> want to give it to you in Rio chips. Uh, but yeah, you just you know, one person has a role, and the other, the other. I used to notice that Mike Sexton and Vince Van Patten, they actually would kind of rotate. They were uh, actually more of a they melted together in that thing. But Lon and I have the more traditional play-by-play uh, -play guy and commentator. Right. Did you feel as though you had to really evolve your style over 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 time? As I can only imagine, you know, the game of poker, you know, sped past you as far as from a skill perspective. You know, back in '03, you might have been, you know, you might have been a decent decent player in the main event with what you knew, and that, of course, you know, has changed a lot. Uh, you know, I should have evolved more, Remco, as far as how my knowledge of the game went. I, I was pretty stubborn and remain pretty stubborn since I don't want to get too much into the strategy part, even if I'm the only person there. I want to make it uh, more you know, more broad for a casual viewer that I didn't want to start studying the game too much because I thought that I would start talking too much about the strategy end. So that might have been a mistake on my part, but I've always wanted to keep it very, let's just have fun with the broadcasts. Let's do the stories. Let's do the characters and all that. And so I've stayed away from the strategy to the point that I don't even study the game which I should study. Yeah, I think I think you're long overdue. Uh, we got Robert Vaconi against John Shipley all in here, and uh, Shipley just, I still can't believe what he did. All right, here comes the flop. It, it happens so quickly sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. King eight deuce, no ace, no ten. Robert needs an ace or ten. John's saying don't come out 
There's the ace. Oh, that could spell the end. The John Robert Shipley. Marconi has been a very lucky man this afternoon. John Shipley needs a seven. Or he's out. Burn and the jack. And that is it. That is John Shipley who came in leading this tournament with over $2 million. Wow, John Shipley, uh, talking about lighting equity on fire. 125 k there for seventh place, even though first is $2 million. Um, kind of crazy to see that. Um about a change in the tide and so as far as being on site for some of these wins and and i know you sat down with you know chris and greg and, and joe and uh jamie uh right after the final tables ended to do a short little interview um were you were you ever drawn into some parties or shenanigans with some of these winners and was there was there ever any any fun nights out after a big main event win look at me Remco. Does it look like someone wants me to be at the party? And do you think I would go to the party? No, I was never drawn in. And there are, you do get invited sometimes. Uh, there are those things that go on. And I would never, first of all, most of the time I had been in Las Vegas for the whole World Series for seven weeks. And I often would be in the car within 30 minutes after conducting that interview, no matter what time it was. I was just out of Dodge immediately back to Los Angeles in my car. Right. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Whenever, whenever I used to be done reporting the World Series, the, um, the the first couple of years I was just reporting on the Dutch players. So like the last Dutch player in the main event busted in like 50, 45th place, and then I woke up three days later finding out who would have made the November nine back. You know when I used to cover it, uh, the November nine was already a thing. Um, but yeah, that is true. It's grueling, and then you're sort of happy to get home. Um, Varconi, by the way, commanding uh, situation right now, still picking up cards, which is very helpful. Um, but shout out to Mr. Hall there, laddering up quite nicely, sitting on just only a few big blinds for quite a while there. You that might yeah, actually, technically, I think they're the only two amateurs uh, at the final table. I can't remember if there was a third. I think this just might have been them. Just said that, uh, he's going all in. I mean, Julian Gardner could have been... A money make like figure, at least internationally. So he's young and you know, like you know, looks looks like a good a good kid as far as from a poker perspective for marketing. A bit. Oh, he's do he he is wearing open toe flip flops. Well, let's just put that on the record, which is you know, kind of a slight look at that. That's 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 a look. I like that. Hey, thinking about calling his all in bet, which again is uh, kind of unusual. He must think that there's a possibility that Julian is trying to buy the... I mean, this guy has a calculator on his watch. He could just, you know, put in the numbers right there. Uh, I don't think you put in the, the numbers on <laughs> Maybe Ace-8 is good. But I, I, I can't seriously see him calling here, but I've been wrong so far in this tournament. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I just, I'm Let's a little help. surprised. Well, I'm a little surprised that he... Yeah, there he goes. No. Ace Julian chose the Queens, and wow. Scott's very happy. Very happy to thrown in. Yeah. Ace eight goes into the muck. Shows the Queens. A lot of showing of cards, by the way. A lot of courtesy shows there at the final table. Yeah, another thing that has virtually disappeared from the landscape, and most people who coach you tell you you never want to show your cards unless there's there's a reason you do. Yeah, but generally, obviously, you don't want to. You just don't want to give the information away unless for some reason you want that information out there so you can somehow switch gears. Yeah. There's Matt Savage, the uh, oh, wow. who was the uh, tournament director there, right behind the dealer, right there. Matt Savage has been around for a long, long time. So he was a uh, tournament director for I think about three or four years of the World Series, and uh, actually proposed to his current wife at the '03 World Series, '03 or '04 World Series. Julian Garner has aces. I mean, talking about the wrong time to make a move like that. Come. Oh. Julian Garner has woke up with a pair of aces, and Russell Rosenblum is in shock. He put all his money in with a jack six of diamonds, trying to buy the annies in the blinds. Nice shove there by Russell, though, with the jack six of diamonds. Back then, back then, that must have been extremely profitable to just shove light. There's Mattisau in the back. I'm saying goodbye anyway. <laughs> But no, he will he will not be out. He'll still be in the tournament. Mike the mouth, very interesting. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Look at this flop. Russell has got jacks and a, a plus draw. <laughs> so right now it's pretty even. Uh, it's almost yeah. exactly even. And Julian can't Look believe his bad good. luck here. He hasn't lost, but uh, he can crushed. lose with a diamond. He can lose with a six or a jack, queen. So now on the last card, 
Russell needs a jack. One more time. A six and, more a time and, and a prayer. One more time <laughs> to the God of poker. A little, we don't man. usually see this. We don't usually see players get down on their knees and ready to poke. Jack or a diamond. Jack or a diamond. He wants a jack, a six or a diamond. And Julian Gaunt is saying no. Anything but a jack, six or a diamond. Here it comes. Jack, six or a diamond. Yes! Oh. Well, the prayer is... Wow, that was a great... That was an even better cheer than the first one. It was. He was elated that time. Russell on his knees. Another set of aces. What happened there is Russell. The funny, the funny thing as well is that the story of Julian Gardner, after he finished second in this event, is how he took all the money he won in cash, and he booked an extra. Um, and and this was during a time that Binion's wasn't doing all too well, so they proposed sending him a check so he could cash that back in the UK. And then instead, what he did was he took it all in cash in a duffel bag, booked, booked an extra seat on the plane and took it all in, all the money in cash back home. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's one of the... Oh, ben, yeah, Binion's wanted to uh, give him a post-data check, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, we're already five hours in and we're still six-handed. It's 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 pretty remarkable. The structure must have been great, but at the same time, players must have been extremely tight back in those days. But that is that is pretty crazy to see. Um, I do... I do. Oh, that's... Um, what, what's his name? Acevedo or Cardoza? Whatever, whatever his name was. He used to write articles for card players sitting in the background. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is that the vibe at Binion's definitely is something really special. I mean, the fact that there are 7,000 waters on the table and a bunch of napkins laying around isn't maybe the most appealing thing for TV. But at the same time, this, this vibe is, is sort of cool. Uh, by the way, what are they filming in the background there? I've never seen that guy before. Um, do you see that? That's kind of weird. Yeah, they're, that's obviously a foreign language or uh, just an overseas broadcast of something of here. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but on the Binion's thing, Remco, yeah, I, I sorely, I was happy that I got in on the last uh, couple of years that they had it at Binion's because I would have not known what I missed if I didn't. Uh, here we got an all in again. Oh, yeah. He needs an eight to come out. A resigned Russell Rosenblum, perhaps? There's an ace and a king. He now needs two eights. And I'm afraid that's it for Russell Rosenblum. He's already moving into position for the congratulatory handshake. Well, actually, King came up here. He can split the pot with the case ace. I don't think he knows it. He's he surrendered and he, he doesn't get the case ace. And Russell Rosenblum is our sixth place finisher. And it's good for $150,000. Not bad for the attorney who came to Vegas for some cards and vacation. And Julian Gardner goes over and congratulates him. Uh, he was, uh, as you said, a very spirited player. All right, down to five here. Not oh, bad cash. for the lawyer from Bethesda, Maryland, who came out to Vegas as an amateur just for a little cards and a vacation. $150,000. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. He's extremely disappointed, which is kind of cool to see as well. Um, but yeah, very long final table, very slow structure, and clearly Harley Hall is still folding his way into another page jump. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how he and, and ends up going out. But this is Ace Eight, probably with two big blinds. That's a good hand at this point to go all in. He's raised about $100,000, and uh, he has to do it because uh, he can't really last too long with these antis and blinds so high. Well, Ralph this Perry shit. now <laughs> he wants to, to play, but hour on it, Ralph. Too considering his whole cards. Ralph's got a queen ten, a hand that has proved very lucky for Robert Barconi. So maybe that's. Uh, on Ralph's mind, you know, you think about the hands that have won before, and that enters into a player's, uh, a player's thought patterns. Uh, he also would like to knock Harley out because every player that goes, it's more money for the players remaining. So he, he doesn't feel he has the best hand at this point, but he's thinking, is it worth it to put in another 100000 And he's got a big decision to make, and I don't blame him for taking a lot of time. Harley uh, not trying to show too much emotion here. 
Now you played in this World Series of Poker uh, a number of times. When you see that, talk about I, I could have won any year I wanted well, I, to. I know that. And I, I let these guys think that they can play, and I play in it most years, and I don't really do well, but I want them to feel good because that's their occupation. I appreciate it, and you want to be here uh, showing people. And I'd rather the do skills. the I'd rather be with you, Ron, <laughs> in the booth watching this go on. I'm flattered. I'm flattered. But when you see that hand that he's got, you've seen that it's worked elsewhere at that final table. Your tendency is, well, maybe it's just today's the day. Well, ask Russell. Now that you're not in the tournament anymore, Russell, what would you think these players have right now? <laughs> you were still sitting at that table. I was, although I wasn't there when the chips went in. Harley's been getting his chips in with, uh, he's probably got a reasonably sized ace, although at this point, he's got to make a move quickly. So, I mean, he could have any sort of, I don't know, I'd say any type of King-10, King-Jack, something like that. He's probably thinking of calling with some sort of mediocre queen. He's probably looking at queen-10 or queen-9 that he's sitting Wow, Russell, sharp. There. Nope, he's calling. I think he's got a bit of queen 10 or queen 9. <laughs> so he called me with last time, I think. I called it medium ace first queen 10. Wow, that's, that's the mind-blowing stuff people on TV would be like, how did he know that? Well, that's, that's a weird production thing again about this. They actually, you know, he was there live with Gabe. And he, they incorporate that into this post-produced tape broadcast. It's just weird. Yeah, and also, Lon and Gabe clearly did some voiceover after as well together. Yeah. But they mixed that in with Gabe's live call as well. Correct. And actually, they threw in, you know, Gabe went on. Here's, let's, let's talk to Russell about this one. Very popular Harley Hall from California. It's a congratulations from Robert Varconi. From Mr. Congeniality. Absolutely. But as you said, uh, Harley was folding his way and laddering up. They, they put up that weird stat. He'd been in 13 hands and lost only one. Uh, so he was actually playing very, very few hands. They're up to like 150 hands now. And obviously with the hands he was winning was he was just raising the blinds and everyone was folding. And those are the hands he's credited for winning. Right. When you, when you watch this, when you're, when you're seeing this footage, like what, what, what stands out to you the most about you know, how the game and how the broadcast has changed? Uh, the game, as you know, is just, first of all, just strategy wise is so much more sophisticated. Uh, it was much more feel and instinct and reads back, back then, especially the old school Texas road gamblers, the Puggy Pearsons, the Johnny Mosses, the Doyle Brunsons, uh, and, and, and the Jack Strausses. So it, it just, there, there wasn't, you know, we, we weren't, we weren't talking GTO. We weren't talking ICM. So that part you see changes in the way they play, uh, the broadcast, you know, it was weird, uh, Ross, uh, Remco, when they asked me to look at these broadcasts in, in 02, I made three notes with the, the greatest three notes I've ever made. I'm not usually right. I told them that to, to have poker on TV, they needed to, to mic up the players so we could hear all of them because I noticed that, as I mentioned, Negrano and Bonetti's heads up was mic'd up, and it was just great to hear those two go back and forth. I noted that you had to see the whole cards. I don't know how that was possible, but for even a poker player, it's just like watching you know paint dry on a wall. If you did not know the whole cards, people would leave the broadcast. And I noted that we, we had to know more about the players, which I still believe about. They just sat down and started playing with these people, and we don't know who they are. There's, there, you know, to get people engaged in the game, you got to know who they are. So back then, they just started rolling the broadcast. There weren't the little up close and personal features on each person uh, as they went along. So uh, those are the three things I noted, and I was three for three on that one, I believe. Wow, the only three for three in your life, but it's a good one to be right, right on. That, no, but seriously, you're right, though. That, that makes such a massive difference, and it's the same thing with getting to know the players. Even doing these shows, running back right now, with, with guys like Chris and Greg and, and Joe Hashem, and even some of the more recent guys like Scott Blumstein and Joe McKeon, doing this show now with them has taught me more about these guys and their story than what I ever figured out you know, about them, even yeah. being in the room while they won the main event. So clearly... It's, it's, it's a task that we all sort of share. And I'm, with we, I mean, you know, people that are in content production in poker is, is doing our best to uh, shine a light on these players. The tough part, however, is that the moment in time that we want to do that is also the most stressful time that these people have, have ever been through. So a lot of them aren't too excited to give you a lot of time because they're trying to win millions of dollars. Uh, without question. In fact, when I deal with the, the research uh team that we have right now and they work really hard i and, and some of them have no real they're not gonna have background in getting research off of poker players 
who are moving tables or on break. It's a very difficult atmosphere to accumulate any information on them. Because as you said, it's very stressful. It's under the brightest lights. They have other things on their mind and they're just not going to go ahead and give you a lot of stuff. Right. All right. What do we have here? Ace Deuce. He's a king or seven. He's not that really much of an underdog. Probably about three to two. The Harley's hand. Okay, three, six, but if nothing comes out, no one makes a pair. Harley's going to win again. Here it comes. Five, jack, eight. No kings, no sevens. Harley is still leading. A seven! And Julian says, thank you. And Holly says, how could you do this to me? He needs an ace on this card. Nope. Yeah. Another seven. <laughs> Julian's made three sevens, and Harley is out of the tournament. What a popular play, player he proved to be here. In very, Las very Vegas. long handshake by Robert Bracconi there. Held on to his hand for way longer than accepted socially. Uh, that's really something we don't want to talk about. Uh, that was a uh, double handshake, by the way. I mean, it is it is strange to think about, you know, when life poker returns. All these mannerisms we see from people are now no longer, you know, we went from handshakes to fist bumps, but still, even that might not be um, acceptable anymore in the in the new climate of poker, which is kind of crazy to think back of, and how, like when I watched the '95 main event final table they were smoking at the table during the during during the broadcast as they were filming just like smoking a lot of cigarettes which is kind of funny to see yeah that's that's amazing to watch the older ones uh i do a lot and actually they were drinking hard liquor a lot of the times at the table uh even here you see them just having water most of them were drinking water uh in 02 they weren't drinking any alcohol right this guy's the real winner for me so far at the final table they made a lot more money not doing much exactly and 200k back in 2002 um afford you a really nice house if you think back of uh you know the 10k that this is a question the 10k main event oh wow poker champion Hold on. and legendary poker player amarillo slim how you doing slim good gabe good to see you again. good to see you so what do you think 631 players you ever think it would come to that couldn't envision it well how has it's changed since there was 30, 40. The year you won, how many players were in the World Series? 18. 18. 18 of us. And we thought we were the only people in the world could play. Now everybody in here can play. From all over the globe. That was cut weirdly, but it's cool to hear <laughs> Amarillo Slim's uh, take on the, on the matter. Um, it, it, it is, oh, back to my point. Um, the main event, 10K buy-in. That, of course, was a massive, massive amount of money but back in the 70s and 80s. But that amount is, as far as inflation goes, going down and down. Should we therefore look at, you know, a 100K event as, you know, comparatively the new main event in that sense? Or is the fact that the 10K price point allows more people to play now, um, you know, good news for the game in general? Yeah, I got to go with the latter there. Uh, I understand and in poker circles, it's just like the 50K Poker Players Championship at the World Series is regarded as, you know, like almost the equivalent of the, the world's greatest athlete is the winner of the decathlon of the Olympics. The, the 50K Poker Players Championship is the Poker Players Championship, literally. But as far as the growth of the game and the continued interest of the game and the access to the game of everybody, that 10K thing is pretty magical. So I have, no, again, it's changed. It was a big deal back then. And, you, you know, there's no satellites. It was a big deal to put up 10K. But I like the fact that we would get thousands and we'd be getting, you know, 10 to 20,000 right now if online poker was legal in the U.S. I like the fact that all those people have that access to this people's championship. It just makes it such a unique thing uh, about the World Series main event. Yeah. So you, you think that we're, we're never, ever going to see them raise the main event buy-in? I can't. I, I would never say never, ever about anything. So it may occur, uh, but I would like to see it stay at 10K. But things change. And you never know. They could even drop it for all we know. You, you just never know what's going to happen. Who we got today? Who we got here? Oh, he's got Harley. Congratulations. Thank you. You seem to be a sentimental favorite among a lot of the people here, local people. Yeah, that, that helped a lot, the uh, support I felt from the crowd. Yeah. What a long, strange trip it's been the last four days. And I'm very fortunate with the stack I've had just to even be here. So you know, I'm Take very home, grateful. Uh, $195,000? Not bad. Not bad for five days' work. Well, Harley, congratulations. 
Gabe, thank you very much. Thanks for glad, playing. Glad I had the opportunity. Must be a hell of a guy to have so many people rooting for you. That, that was very nice. Yeah, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> thank you. Okay, our fifth place finisher, Harley Hall. I don't want to speak ill of Gabe, but I could have I could have done a better job probably this uh, interview. Uh, uh, I, again, actually, I believe that his next three interviews, he keeps telling, he tells what the, uh, the the total is that you want, and go not bad, not bad for a day's work or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and Gabe's being polite there about 195 being good for five days work because Gabe used to headline in Las Vegas and he would sneeze at 195,000 for five days work. I looked at the inflation calculator, Norm. What what yeah. do you, what do you think uh, 10k was worth back in 1971? Oh, God, you know I'm never good with this. And this number is just going to blow my mind, actually, when you tell me this. 10K back in 1971? Yeah. I can't even make a guess. I want to hear the number, though. Uh, $63,000. 63K in 71, so 10K. How insane is that? Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, I remember that my parents bought their, you know, the house they still live in in 1963 for $23,000. And their, their, their monthly mortgage payment was $220 a month for 30 years. And he could barely make it, my father. That's uh, yeah, just, I want to pull my hair out right now. But yeah, I mean, you, go for, you go for midnight tacos in LA and you might spend that much. <laughs> we, got, we got Varconi back in action Robert's against the Scott. Robert's got to get lucky one more time and catch uh, Queen or 10. <laughs> this is this is the ongoing thing with Varconi and the Queens, right? This is the Queen Ten. He what kept playing the hand. It's done for Scott. Scott got a nine. It's over. Scott Gray caught an ace and a nine, but wasn't enough because Robert Varconi caught two queens on the flop. And I'm assuming it started. Helmuth must have been at a table with him where Queen Ten was played and actually he stayed remember do you remember how this blow up i believe when adam uh levy <laughs> adam levy i think played queen 10 against him yep at the world's at the main event that was that was 2008 and for the people wondering about that hand we just put it on, on youtube that exact hand so if you go to the poker central uh, youtube account if you're watching this on there or whether you're on facebook that hand is in the top five hands of the 08 main event which is is one of my favorite hands of all time like 08 08 was like a prime helmuth year he goes off on the romanian guy calls him an idiot seven times and then that hand against adam levy it's just it's on it's truly spectacular it's really incredible and Ruthless handled it so well. He was so deft in that situation. I got to give him props. The, the, the best line from Ruthless is that he said he made an aggressive call. And, and That's the, right, an aggressive call. It was pretty funny. Uh, which is obviously a 2 plus 2 reference, but Helmuth wasn't having it at all. He was definitely not having it. Oh, by the way, Ralph Perry took off the jacket, which is breaking news. Look at that. Sh I mean, come on. I, I, I could not have concentrated on anything else in this final table except that shirt. It would have just... It just would have tilted me. And Julian Gardner is for sure drinking a rum and coke right now. I just saw him take a sip. That is for sure a rum and coke. Uh, by the way, if anyone is watching and can find me this Ralph Perry shirt, which probably cost seven hundred dollars from Armani or something, but if you can find me a ripoff, I'll wear it on one of these shows because th this is truly spectacular. This is. Uh, I'm glad you've made that commitment because that would look so cool on you, and someone will find something close to that. I mean, I'm comfortable in lycra these days, so I, I can basically pull anything off. Uh, it's his credit. This atmosphere, you're talking about billions before. Just like, just, just, just look at this compared to the Penn and Teller Theater. The fact that they all are just, it's like close in. It's like when you're, you're at Lambeau Field or Wrigley Field. Just everybody's close in. And then when there's an all in, people actually surge towards the table. Some photographers, some backers. It's just an amazing gambling atmosphere that uh, we don't have anymore. Yeah. So do you think it is possible now that we, have I mean obviously probably not because of just you know business relationship as far as Binions and and the and, the, and Caesars and the Rio, but would it be cool to like play the final table at Binions again? It would be okay. They they'd have to bring in somebody to just exterminate some of the smells or whatever you do. But yes, it would be that you know I, I went into Binions twice in the last year, and part of it's sad to look at, but it has such still. The old gambling hall field that Las Vegas was built on uh, in, in downtown Las Vegas. It would be great to have that atmosphere again as sort of a retro uh, thing for a final table, at least. So that's a pretty good idea. I don't think it'll happen, but that's a pretty good idea. Right. We have Ralph Perry raising with jacks. We have Varconi all in with aces. And now we have Julian Gardner in the tank. And then he was going to go all in with his tens. Tens. I think, you know, if I'm reading him correctly. Tens for Gardner. And he was very Gabe surprised says. when Robert... Went all in now. 
He's, he's frustrated. He he's doesn't know got, what to do. He's got two opponents. He's got to Just, worry about Robert because Robert has more chips than him. And if he loses to Sandra Robert, he's out of the tournament. There's also a big difference between second and third place. He might want to let Ralph and Robert fight it out because second place is $1,100,000. No. And that's what he's going to do. He's not going to play the tens. He's going to let Ralph and Robert fight it out, but Ralph's got to decide now if he wants to go all in with a pair of jacks. Interesting on Julian's part because maybe he is thinking to that heads up man on man final. I think he is, and he's also thinking that with two players, his tens probably aren't good, that one of them probably has a better hand. It was a very smart play to lay him down. All right, so now it's up to Ralph Perry to make the decision. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, this guy's got a monster. You can hear them chatting in the background. Gardner saying, I had two well, tens. He's done too well against Robert. Cool. But he does have a pair of jacks. And if he could double through Robert, he's going to do it. He's going. Oh, yeah. well, and he's not going to be too happy when he sees uh, Robert Zaysi. All right, so it's Ralph Perry and Robert Barconi. There are the jacks. And we've already seen this, but he shows oh the two aces to the rest of the house. Oh, he would lose his life if he did that today. <laughs> I mean, to the Russian-American in the Armani suit? Are you serious, Robert? <laughs> Play, playing with fire over there. That's... <laughs> oh, and Mike Sexton in the, in the track suit, by the way. That's pretty cool, too. Big smile. Robert Barconi's face. Flop. Not much help. Ralph Perry needs a jack. Two cards left. One of them's got to be a jack, or he's a third place finisher. Another nine. One card left. Ralph Perry needs a jack here. There's two jacks left in the deck. He needs one of them right here. A three. That's it. Ralph Perry comes in third. What a great run he had. He had a lot of terrific hands, very entertaining hands. Ralph Perry going out in third position. And look at that, two tens. Everybody sees it now in the house. Tens, jacks, and aces on that last hand. Very unusual. Ralph Perry puts his jacket back on. Maybe you should have left it on. <laughs> well, Gardner is just congratulating himself, as you mentioned, that he was out of that hand. He could have been blown away with the rest of them. And well, yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, an interesting thing also was that uh, Robert Varconi having the aces could have sucked Julian in if he just called the $200,000 raise by Ralph, but he decided that he wasn't going to take any chances. He scared him off. The big question is, who's the guy in the lilac suit behind them the entire time? I thought it was Mike Caro at first, but it's not. But look, look at it this guy. It does look like Mike Caro, but it's not. It's Mike, it's, it's Mike Caro's even more Italian cousin who runs a mob outfit in New Jersey, probably. <laughs> All these players are exhausted. Oh, yeah, we so. often forget them, and, and Julian's not going to become the youngest champion, but you know, if he did become, we forget these, you know, how lucky you've got to get in certain moments. If Varconi doesn't have the aces right there, Julian is going to call all in, and he's going to, he's going to get crushed. Jacks right. against tens, right? You know, and so you you get lucky in those moments that we don't usually even see. So he gets lucky that Varconi actually had the aces, because then he could get out of the way. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a, that's a very good point, actually. And now they're bringing out the cash. Uh, nowadays, this is all fake cash, but something something leads me to believe this is actually real cash. The way the money bends there, that looks like real money. I don't know if it is. I know in 03 it was not. So the year later it was not because I just assumed it was real money until they showed me that it was a $100 bill on the outside and all $1 bills on the inside, uh, which really disappointed me. But uh, I just, I can't believe uh, the Binions would put this much cash out on the table. They I mean, don't even have that much cash. I mean, Binions did have a million dollars on million dollars on display. So maybe this came from the display case. <laughs> there's there's Benny Binion. More prize money has been awarded at the World Series than at all the Grand Slam golf championships combined. And unlike commercially sponsored golf, the World Series is totally funded by the players themselves. The World Series has grown at a staggering pace since its humble beginnings when Benny Benyon invited eight of the world's best players to play until one emerged as champion. Well, Johnny Moss won that championship and a couple more, but even he would shake his head in disbelief at this year's numbers for six weeks, more than 7,500 players from dozens of countries played in 35 individual championships. Wow, Antonio. most of the variations of stud, Raz, Omaha, Texas Hold'em, and draw. Almost $20 million in prize money was awarded. The ultimate world champion is determined by a five-day tournament culminating in this event today. 
They are playing seven card, no limit, Texas Hold'em with a $10,000 buy-in. This year, a record 631 players contributed more than $6 million to the prize pool. I mean, seven card, seven card Texas Hold'em is definitely a, a, a game, a way to describe the game that I haven't heard ever. Uh, there's a way to do it. There's the uh, Becky pin, right? Right. Anywhere in any sport. We're so, with Becky Binion, oh, right, the has to owner say. of the Horseshoe. Becky, how many of these tournaments have you seen? All of them. All of them? I've been to all of them. From the time your daddy started them? Yes, uh -huh. 33 years ago. And the bracelet here is what today's winner is going to get along with $2 million? Yes, uh, and it's diamond and platinum. And we thought it'd be different to have, uh, nice to have a different bracelet to mark the winner of the World Series of Poker. This is what poker players all over the world go for. This is, means you're number one, numero uno in the world of poker, the champion of the World Series of Poker, and the $2 million is very nice, but this is stature. This means you're the best poker player in the world if you have this on your wrist. Uh, it does not, and the $2 million is more valuable than the bracelet. By the way, it's interesting how Alon always disappears uh, from that booth setup when Gabe. It's very nice, Alon, just to, to give up a seat to one of two people always, all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um Norm, as far as we, we saw Emerald Slim earlier, as far as connecting with the history of the game, have you had the chance to talk to many of the guys who were around during the 70s? Because you were always looking for stories and information. And I can imagine that back in those early years, and I even, I even spoke to Emerald Slim once before he passed when I was first at the World Series of Poker back in 2009. But what was it like for you those first couple of years? Were you trying to extract stories from some of these guys? I, again, they weren't around as much, but yes, I was because I thought it was important since uh, poker really wasn't in the mainstream, certainly on television, that we somehow link the past to the present at the time, that people get sort of a tutorial in history of the generations beforehand because most people wouldn't be familiar with the Puggy Pearsons and the Amarillo Slims and the Jack Strausses. So yes, Amarillo actually had written a book with Greg Dinkin, a uh, poker player, uh, a really nice guy. And so they were promoting that book one year, so I got to talk to Amarillo extensively i i talked to i got to play with puggy pearson at uh, stud high low uh, two or three times during the world series in cash games uh and i got to uh, obviously deal with doyle at that time and some of the other earlier ones but just i tried to seek him out and a uh, billy baxter who's maybe the greatest poker storyteller of all time which is saying a lot because there's a lot of good poker storytellers yeah no, that's that's definitely really cool that the the game is still young enough to where uh, we had a real connection with the people from that generation because if you say it out loud, it still sounds insane. Back in 1970, $10,000, or at least you know back then it was a vote, but in 71, they played the main event for the first time with a 10K buy-in. I think this might be the segment where Helmut is talking about Varconi, so I'm just going to scroll back because I saw a lot of people laughing in the crowd, so we might have to listen in to, uh, to what's being said here between Gabe and this must be like a young tournament director or something because... No, that's... Uh, that's uh, little uh, younger Binion. That's Benny, uh, Benny's son... Uh Benny Jr. Oh. When the final table started, there's a gentleman named Phil Helmuth, a very modest man. <laughs> very beloved gentleman around the World Series of Poker. Former world champion, seven-time bracelet winner. Former world champion, seven-time bracelet winner. He was knocked out of the tournament by Robert with a queen ten. Very sorely because he held an ace king. I can't believe that Phil Helmuth would get sore about anything. He's just a magnanimous, giving, caring, sensitive type of guy who cares more about other people's feelings than his own. Well, well Gabe, I mean, if somebody pushed it in on you before the flop and you had Ace King and they turned over Queen 10, you'd be a little upset too. I would just smile and say, nice hand. Well, how would you feel inside though? Okay, well, we know how Phil felt inside because he said that if Robert won this tournament, he would shave his head or he would let Robert shave his head. I don't, think we've ever, I don't think we've ever had a tidbit like this at the World Series. We've never had this, but we do, just in case, have a pair of clippers. And we will be ready to clip, or Robert will be ready to clip, if he happens to win his tournament. So. Beside the $2 million and the bracelet, there's further incentive for Robert. It, 
there's no question who you're rooting for to win this thing. Well, wait a minute now. I, I lose either way. Think about this, because if Julian Gardner wins it, then he's the youngest player to ever win. He takes away my title of being the youngest player to ever win. And if he wins, I get my head shaved, which has never happened before. So I lose either way, baby. <laughs> Go to war, gentlemen. That's just like Phil Helmuth, never thinking about himself, just hoping. <laughs> Now we have a good tournament. We're down to our final two players, Benny. Let's get it on. That's actually tremendous. That's actually that, a great that is moment. That's great. By the way, this is why poker is just a weird animal again. Can you imagine that the break they take before they go heads up, which was quite a while. Can you imagine, like, I don't know what it is. It's, it's not quite equivalent, but the U.S. Open, uh, Nadal and Federer are playing, and it's two sets all. And before the fifth set starts, they, you know, they go over and they have a little back and forth. and this. It's just absurd. And we take this break and they just do all this stuff and they sit down. It's just poker's unique. It's also it's also ridiculous if you think about it because these guys put up their own money. They're playing for a life changing amount, and everybody's making a lot of the situation talking about Phil Helmut getting his head shaven. It's like it, it probably takes a bit of the tension out of the air, but it's still ridiculous when you think about it. Like maybe they made a deal, maybe not, but it's still, you know, an incredible moment in their lives, and all of a sudden Helmut is there to steal the shine. Which, give him credit, by the way, he knows how to be entertaining. And as I tell people, ask me one of the most frequent questions, I guess, Remco, is, is he really that way? Did he just get that way with the TV cameras? I go, oh, no. As far as being upset about taking bad beats, he was doing that well before the cameras came along. People have incredibly legendary stories about how he's losing it uh, well before he was on ESPN. Yeah, which is great, too. And the funny thing is, I've, I've had a, a chance to share a few moments with him uh, off the felt. Uh, as far as you know, just talking to him, and his passion runs so deep that he 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 doesn't like turn it on or off. He's always on, and all the credit goes to his lovely wife, who has been dealing with him for, you know, however many however long, and he's never cheated on her. Did did you know that? I think he's he's mentioned that more than once, which makes me think he had to. Who would say that that often? I just don't believe them when they say it that often. But yes, he has been. Uh, there's no infidelity going on there that we're aware. Of. Exactly. Let's listen to Ralph Perry. I love to play in a horseshoe. They have the best tournament. You're $550,000 richer. Nice country, America. Wow, what a country. <laughs> what a country. <laughs> I love it. You know, when I when I said that I would uh, shave my head, I uh, I didn't realize that Robert was capable of playing as well. What, what, what are you going to say, Norm? Well, first of all, Helmuth is misspelled there, which is, again, I don't think the graphic mistakes are enough to send me into therapy twice a week. Yeah, that's a very good point. What I do love as well, when you see in the background, the clock that they use for the blinds has remained the same for about 35 years. It's like this, this it's, it's incredible. It really is. Uh, Julian, who's regarded as the top young player in Europe, Julian calls. He has a 4 5 offsuit, and Robert lets it go. Robert's got Jack 7. See the flop. King 4 3. Julian has a pair of fours with his 4 5. Robert checks. Julian bets a little bit, 30, 40,000. Robert throws his hand away. Yep, didn't want it. You know, we got into trouble a few times in the first couple of years, Remco, because to find out the whole cards, we would ask the players what they held in a situation where they folded a big hand. And uh, we were not smart enough to know that they would lie to us. So the, the two plus two forms were, were killing the production the first couple of years that he couldn't have had that and blah, 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 blah. And they were probably right. Uh, they were just lying to us. So basically you guys put the cards on screen, even, even though they. Yeah, yes. Certain situations where we didn't have the whole card camera, obviously at the feature, only the feature table. So when it was an outer table, we a producer or somebody would go up to somebody afterwards and go, all right, can you tell us what you had there? And they would tell them, but they weren't telling the truth all the time. Chris Moneymaker told the story on this very show, and for people who are watching uh, this back home, you can go back to the archives on YouTube to watch every single run back I've ever done. And Moneymaker told the story of him getting a phone call from the production team months after the fact about this one hand that he played, and I think he had like 6-5 suited or something. Uh, but basically, they had no idea of the cards that he had, so they had to phone him up, and he, he told them. But yeah, he could have lied, but yeah, he told the truth. Or at least he lied. maybe he lied to me as well. We don't, we, we'll never know. We don't know. Chris is... I think Chris would have told the truth, but he, that's just reminding me that besides walking up to them sometimes right after the hand, that in that situation, that happened a lot too, where we're talking to people months afterwards, asking them to recall what the cards were, and they may be mistaken. They usually aren't. They would know what they had. Right. 
a lot of re- reporters there on the scene as well. A lot of um, news outlets probably covering it for you know newspapers and, and and whatnot, which is kind of funny to see Chris Ferguson there with the notepad in the background as well, probably working on his column for for uh, some kind of magazine or something. It's essentially thirty five Kev Mats back there, uh, and I just prefer <laughs> one Kev Math because he's Kev Math. Oh my God! I I was gonna say is that Kev Math a few times on the broadcast because there's there's quite a few. People there in the background that you know could pull off uh, the Kev Math look there. Um, I'm still worried though about the guy in the lilac suit because he greatest suit ever. He looks threatening and he looks like he stepped out of a 1980s movie straight into this O2 main event. Oh. You know he's probably somebody well known that we are not. Oh, there's a. Oh, I just saw another. Uh... Oldie but goodie used to work with Adam Schoenfeld. Uh, I can't remember. Not what I expected to happen. Oh, Diego Cordovez? Yeah, well, there, there it was. It was Diego. Expected a little more? Expected someone to do something. <laughs> Interesting study. But it's easy to say. And also, they signed the table before the final table instead of after. So they're playing on an, on an autographed felt, and they must have put this somewhere. I'm kind of curious where this went because it's kind of a cool part of history. It is. It's cool that everybody signs it, and I'm sure somebody had to maybe bought it at auction. It's got to be somewhere, I hope. Yeah, for sure. I know that Mori Eskandani has a lot of collectibles in his collection, but you know he he wasn't part of this production, and I know that he um, kept a lot of the stuff from like the taping of High Stakes Poker and Poker After Dark. Oh, there's Phil Ivey, by the way. Hello. Uh, coming down the escalators. Phil well, Ivey won uh, three bracelets. The year he won three bracelets, O2, and he made a really deep run in uh, the main event. He, he cashed. Right. I mean... For Ivy, poker back then, and same probably goes for guys like Negrano and Seidel and, and Jennifer Harmon, um, they must have thought that this would have kept on going forever and they could have never, maybe, they, they could basically never lose. Um, and, you know, how much the game has changed for those people to still be on top and to still play at the highest level. That is the, probably one of the most remarkable things about this game in general. I think about how young Ivy was in 02, uh, that three bracelet year. And uh, Jennifer Harmon, you mentioned she won a bracelet in 02, I believe, her second bracelet. Right. Uh, yeah, just tremendous names back then and tremendous talent that stayed alive well beyond this year. Right. Has two jacks on the button. <laughs> All right. He's going to raise. Ivy was 24. 24. Julian going out here. Julian's right. Julian, besides the chance to become the youngest champion, that's what I was trying to remember before. He becomes the youngest player ever to win a million uh at a poker tournament right. when, he, when he finished second year. And they were playing heads up for a million dollars, which is also quite ridiculous. So here we go. A pair of jacks versus a nine, seven of diamonds. King of diamonds, three of diamonds. Mm-hmm. Now that gives uh, Julian a flush draw. Let's see how he plays it. He checks. Robert's going to play. Robert bets 80,000. Now Julian can raise here, or he can just call. He's going to call for sure. I would think he'd probably raise something just to find out where Robert is at. He's right at the other end of the table. Robert <laughs> and raising for information used to be one of that's his true. favorite moves. Find out where you're at. <laughs> yeah, but that's what this game is. You have to take a chance at some point. He'd probably be taking a chance at the wrong point if uh, if he bets a lot, because with that king out there, it'd be hard for Robert to call. But he just calls the eighty thousand. He doesn't raise at all. Just calls the eighty thousand, hoping for a diamond to come. Three. My earlier years, Remco, I used Three to go. Three is not a list. dangerous card. You never go all in on a draw. <laughs> I used to get a very bad email about that, and they were correct. But I just I could never go all in on a draw if I was playing no limit hold. That's why I don't play no limit hold. Right. Because in, in, li- in limit games, you check raise your draws and then bet, bet, hoping they fold, or are you or just calling, hoping you make it? Well, either way, you're, you're just putting in one more bet. Right. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, that's the thing about limit games, just one more bet. The idea of putting all your chips in and you don't have a hand yet, my father didn't raise me that way. And that's yeah. what was my, the extent of my poker strategy. Are you also of the belief that uh, check raising should not be allowed? I was. I thought check raising was really rude. I thought check raising was like somebody invites you into their house and welcomes you, and as you're taking your coat off, they just splash some cold water into your face. You go, ah! Oh my God! Uh, I, whenever I see a photo of the old signs of no check raising allowed in this poker room, and I believe that one of the photos I saw was from the Golden Nugget, is just one of the. Cool- oh, that's hilarious! Really, that's I've never seen those signs. Yeah, yeah, they're they're 
th like there's no 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 checking and raising allowed in this poker room. Well, Robert won the hand, uh, and Julian thought Robert had a pair of kings. We still don't know what Robert would have done if Julian would have put him to the test and put all his money in. Would Robert have been able to call with the jacks? That's something we're never going to know. I wonder if Julian regrets that. Robert had a lot of big hands once he got going. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's very obvious from watching this broadcast that, you know, it, it was just Varconi's day. Like, yeah. aside from the, even from the Shipley hand, which really, you know, gave him a lot of chips, he also had, he had the hand every single time. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Joe McKeon earlier about his 2015 main event, and he, of course, the big chip leader coming into the final table. And McKeon told me, like, he had no adversity at all after uh, getting a lot of chips on day six. So on day six, McKeon uh, wow. doubles through Josh Beckley, hitting that uh, queen on the river, ace king, ace queen. And he, he, right. he told me si a after that hand, there was no adversity whatsoever. He won every single all in from that point forward. And that's how you win the main event. That's amazing. So I remember he had smooth sailing at the final table. I didn't recall it as he's talking about after that double up on day six. He had no, no just all smooth sailing on day six also. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous, but yeah, he he all <laughs> that's funny as well. McKeon was very funny, and he had a lot of interesting things to say. But he also said that his final table was one of the most boring final tables in WSOP history, just because everything went his way. There was there was no adversity at all. Yeah, not a lot of big moments at that final table. Right. How many how many players could you name from 2015 final table? Uh, not many. I remember the. I, see, I always have trouble remembering this so josh made it uh and my jersey boy made it it was a very a very heavy east was it tom Pinoli at that final tom, table tom was Pinoli, yeah he was there yeah and now i'm having trouble remembering anybody else yeah i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna name them all but i i, I had to do some digging as well to uh to name them all but yeah you know zvi stern the tanker pierre noble and neil blumenfield and um then there were the all the jersey kids patrick chan Canuli, josh beckley yeah, there was a whole, whole bunch of kids. Okay. Oh, Ma Max, Max Steinberg, by the way. Let's not forget him. Oh, yeah, he finished about sixth. You know, it kills me. Remco, it's my memory. Sometimes I see a list of a final table from 12 or 14 years ago, and there's one or two names I go, I don't think he made the final table. And it's on the final table list, and I can't even remember he made the final table. Oh, man. There, there, are some, there are some names every now and then, like, you know, someone like Steve Begleiter. You're like, oh, yeah, he was there. Like, that's it's so easy to forget. Thinking. You shouldn't misspell satellite. One satellite to get in. How hard is it to spell satellite? How many misspellings are going to be? You're driving me crazy. Oh my God. How, how do they even make these uh, Chirons? Like, is this like just, you know, some guy hoping that he gets it right? Yeah, they walk into Radio Shack, they take the second person out of line, and we go, you need, we need you to make Chirons over the next two hours. Now, now I'm looking for it too. I'm trying. To, Ma Manchester is still on the screen. They never corrected that. They corrected Bethesda, Maryland on Russell Russell. Someone noticed that. Oh my God. Hand one sixty one at the World Series of Poker finale. Julian Gardner, Robert Varconi, head to head. Varconi with a huge chip lead. Actually, about five to one. And Robert Varconi. Uh, raise. Look at this. He's got his favorite hand again, <laughs> Queen Ten, and he's going to raise with it. He raises $50,000. Julian Gardner has a pretty good hand. He has a jack eight of clubs, so I'm sure he's going to call. TJ? TJ. The same way Ming Lai has stayed young, TJ Klee has always been old. <laughs> like, I've never, I've never seen TJ Cloutier not look like TJ Cloutier. It's so funny. You should tell him you get a kick out of that. He told him that. Two fours, but two clubs. <laughs> Julian's already got two clubs. He's got a flush draw here, and Robert's got a pair of queens. Robert bets another fifty thousand dollars. And it's Julian, remember the last time he had a flush draw, he didn't put Robert to the test. Let's see what he does now. All in. All in. Oh, he's going all in. He's playing this hand differently. <laughs> now, Robert's got a very tough call. He's got a queen with a 10 kicker. But this hand has been very good to him. for the whole He calls. <laughs> so, this could be the end of Julian Gardner. Yes. Julian doesn't catch a club. This could be the end. 
Robert has Queen 10 off duty. Top hitters are 84 points above draw. The 10. Slate 10 of diamonds. That makes Robert too fair, but that doesn't really matter because Julian can still win with a club. Unless it's the 10 of clubs. Then Julian would make a flush and Robert would have a full house. Look at this. It's the 10 o'clock. Oh my God, it's the 10 o'clock. Robert has made a full house and Julian has, has made a flush. Well, Julian had to think maybe he had the hand, but no, it was the 10, as you mentioned. And it is Robert Varconi, the amateur from Brooklyn, New York, who is the new World Series of Poker Champion 2002. What an amazing final hand. It's amazing that he won with the Queen 10. Queen 10 has been very good to him. He's won about four major hands in this tournament with the Queen 10, a hand that a lot of people wouldn't even play. And his wife, Olga, gives him the biggest prize of all. And Julian's got to feel good about where he ended up. A millionaire here at the World Series of Poker, his first time at the final table. Almost the youngest champion in the history of this event. He played very well, and he made the right move on that. You have to move all in. You cannot wait to make a flush. You have to put the guy to How they call it horseshoe millionaires? Because you can't take the million outside the horseshoe, I think, is why they're called horseshoe millionaires. Robert Varconian to give him the red jacket. We're not like the Masters Golf Tournament. We have a red jacket. Hold on. Presented to him. Hold on. I don't remember. I don't remember this. The red jacket? Yeah. This is, I think, the only year there was a red jacket. I don't recall a red jacket either. So the Poker Masters now has the purple jacket, which has been a tradition now for three years running. I did not know there was a red jacket before that because this is pretty cool. Is the 2000 winner of the World Series of Poker, Chris Ferguson, along with Jack and Benny Bainan. They're going to present it to our new world champion of poker. Oh, he puts it on, too. This is amazing. Oh, the guy in the lilac suit is still there. Robert, which is going to be sweeter? Winning the $2 million, winning that beautiful silver bracelet, or being able to shave Phil Helmuth's head? Shave Phil Helmuth's head. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's all about Phil Helmuth, even though this guy just won two million dollars. It's amazing. So clever on Phil's behalf. There we go. All right. Congratulations to our new poker champion, Robert Valcone, and his wife. Sit down, Phil. Oh, here he goes. Phil, Phil is going to save his hair and try to sell it on the. The Chir I, whoever made these Chirons, get in touch with me. <laughs> There's a job waiting for you to be the run of the back, the run of the back Chiron man. I've never had my head shaved before, so. I think. Be school of barbarism. Saving the hair to put it on eBay, which didn't exist then. Great, great Andy Glazier in the background taking notes, uh, early poker reporter. And who's the guy on the on the right there? In the a devilfish oh. in the back also. Devilfish with the colored glasses. Yeah. Marcel Lusk on the left there. That's a great crowd. That is a great crowd. Who wants to buy Phil Helmut's hair for charity? What is this stuff? Oh, that's what it's for. Okay. I was wondering if we had the bag. This is amazing. <laughs> How many people would do this? Give Phil credit. Yeah, definitely. We have we have to give Phil credit for sure. That's that's really funny. All right, we've reached the end of this broadcast, Norm. How do you look back on the O2 main event? Well, from a broadcast standpoint, by the way, it was an, an awful production. <laughs> if you just look at that final hand. If, if you played that back, there's by the way, Lon and Gabe are kind of stumbling and mumbling over the. It's the <laughs> final hand. There's no buildup of the moment. Uh, you got a ten o'clock, you know, blah blah blah, blah and then the, it's just there's just just nothing there. So the broadcast from start to finish, I thought stunk. Uh, this was a tremendous two hours to watch, though. 
by the way, Barconi, the first and the second amateur ever to win the main event, Hal Fowler, who disappeared. That became another great story. He beat uh, Bobby Hoff in, I believe, 79, called the greatest upset in poker history. Uh, Hoff was such an accomplished player, and Hal Fowler was an amateur at the time. And then he never came back, and he disappeared. And he actually passed away a few years ago. But where Hal Fowler went, nobody knew. Then Varconi, the second amateur ever to win, the Varconi effect, then predating the moneymaker effect. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible to watch this. And for the people who are getting really tired of Norm and I talking over the action, we will release this action on Poker Go in the near future. We have a lot more action coming to Poker Go as we are also releasing all the prelims from 04 up until recent on Poker Go. So, um, Norm, can we just bring those back in some kind of capacity? Because I loved watching Joe Awada, Marcel Lusk, and, and, um, What's the East Coast guy's name? Uh, but there were the, the seven card stud final table and you know stuff like that. Men, uh-huh. men win spilling his beer and, and like there, there were so there were so many great moments from those broadcasts. Those again, I, I know they get disdained by people who don't want to watch No Limit Hold'em back then. Those were tremendous broadcasts. The the, the bracelet events, including some that weren't No Limit Hold'em, uh, great personalities. And uh, there's one that was uh, never went to ESPN and it went straight to home video. That might have been the uh, Deuce to Seven triple draw uh that that did not make it onto espn <laughs> that was a difficult one for tv at that point that might have been the one won by uh, kevin from the office have you did you did you watch the office yes i did watch the office so Rich. in the in the office kevin kevin talks about oh, win, winning winning right. a WS, wsfp event um which he said was a triple draw or i think he said it was deuce to seven i'm not sure if he, if he specified whether it was single draw or a triple draw. Um, anyway, this was tremendous. I, I really love doing this. It's so much fun diving back into the history books. And, you know, maybe maybe we have to do this again and, like, watch, like, the 1973 main event or something. Uh, it's a pleasure. Actually, this was more – I knew it would be good, but this was just fun to watch. Uh, I usually don't like spending this much time with you, but we're not in the same room. This was really terrific. Uh, I, I really loved watching. By the way, this shot right now, at the far left, that's Marsha Wagner next to Marcel Luce, one of the greatest female – uh, World Series performers of all time. It's just great to see all those people. You see her, you see Marcel, you see Devilfish, you see Little Binion, you see, I wish we had the Lilac guy here because I'm sure he's somebody well-known that we're idiots that we don't know. Li- Lilac guy is my favorite new character that we have to uncover in some kind of capacity. So uh, we're going to put out an APB to find this guy. So if, if someone is watching and recognizes Lilac guy because he was in the frame, um, I think he's standing right behind me. I'm going to find Ma- him. Maury Escondani's got to know him. Yeah. That guy had to owe Maury money at some point. There he is. Look at him. I mean, he, he's got like one hand in his pocket, the other one probably holding, you know, a cash or, or a weapon of some kind. Um, very, very threatening look. But I, I do love the fact that we get to dive back into history. And I'm just happy that all this stuff was filmed back in the day because now we get to both make fun of it but also look back at it. Um, Norm, thanks once again for doing this with me. Um, you know, I'll send you my invoice for... Because you have to pay me to be on the show. That's how it works. I understand. Yeah. It was uh, almost a pleasure, sir. Exactly. It was, it, was, it was an adequate performance by both of us. Uh, for the people who are still watching this, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. And then I would say until the next one because I'm going to have plenty more guests on the show. Jamie Gold promised me to be on the show. And if someone has Jerry Yang's phone number, please let me know because I'd love to have Jerry Yang on the show because that would be a tremendous one as well. Uh, for Norman Chad, my name is Rem Kurinkama, and this was a Run It Back.